everyone, I'm Megan Swope. Um, I'm here with you for this next session in our little virtual PD ed camp to talk to you about some tools that go beyond G Suite to enhance instruction. Although truth be told, we kind of struggled with a name for this one because all of the tools I'm going to show you today are actually Google products. They just go beyond the G Suite tools of docs and sheets and forms and um, slides that you're normally used to, but these are all resources that are not only available, but are free and are fantastic to use with kids of a wide variety of ages. So if those of you who don't know me, just to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a social studies teacher at Pensbury West, and I've been there since 1999. Please don't do the math. Um, but starting this fall, I was uh, hired as the high school instructional technology coach, and I am also a Google certified trainer. So these, G, these Google products are really near and dear to my heart. Just as a quick refresher about where you can find some resources that will be useful for you during this presentation and afterwards. Um, you can go ahead and click here. Um, well, as I'm looking at this in the presentation, you, the link that I just showed you will be available in one of the resources. All of you are probably already on this Google Sheet um, calendar, if you will, that's on our distance learning website. This is how you got into the stream and or in to watch the recording. During the recording, we are here at our 3 o'clock p.m. on Thursday session. You can click this link to ask live questions during the presentation. Um, if you are looking for a copy of the resource I'm going to use, which has links to all of these different Google websites I'm about to talk to you about, you can click here to make a copy of that resource for yourself. And you can also see the live question and answer um, set feedback coming through here where it says CQ&A. This is the Google. Google response sheet that's coming from the live question. So if you're watching live, you can check this out for some answers. My um, partner in crime here, Sandy Kandravi, is helping to moderate this session. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, this gives you a good idea of some questions that may have been asked during the recording. So with that being said, I'm gonna jump back to my resource. Um, all of the all of the links I'm about to show you are also available on our digital learning tools website. Um, these are all linked with links to the site with a little description of each one and for some with some added links to help you learn more about each one. So I know that these appear in a slightly different order on our website, but I decided to sequence these say in order really from the most simple to the most complex, quite honestly. Um, and again, these are tools that can be used for all ages. So one kind of fun resource for kids is this Google AutoDraw website. Now I will, um, you know, self, full self-disclosure, I have absolutely no artistic talent. So my art teachers out there, I can use all the help I can get. But AutoDraw is really a, a fun resource. Um, and again, completely free. This little fast how-to kind of takes you into a little tutorial of this, but I'm just gonna click here, start drawing. And it takes me to this blank canvas. Now, bear in mind, I am doing this with a mouse. I don't even have a stylus. So you add the mouse to my complete lack of artistic talent. But I'm gonna start to draw. This is my version of trying to draw a boat. I know, pathetic, right? But look what's happening at the top. Google is using AI to be like, oh, you were trying to draw a boat. Yes, that looks a whole lot better than what I was attempting to draw. We can change colors. I can, you know, maybe I want to draw sunshine up here. So I'm drawing a little scene. And yeah, look, Google's like, oh, look, yes, you want a sun. Yes, thank you, Google. That is what I was trying to draw. So like I said, this is a great website. Um, it does all kinds of things. Maybe it thinks I was actually trying to draw a spider web or a snowflake or a different snowflake as the case may be. Um, but you can you can imagine how kids of all ages can have all kinds of fun with this. Like I said, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these um, options over here. There's, you know, we can change our drawing tip. You can add text. You can fill things. So if I wanna fill that with yellow, now I have a more colorful boat. 
Um, and the great thing about this, first of all, there's, you know, there's an undo button. The great thing about this is once you have this on your screen, the kids can do screenshots. They can insert this as an image wherever they would like. So this can, this is a great tool for students to create some kind of somewhat self-created art for a project. So that's Google Auto Drill. And I'm going to pause in between each one since I am going to jump really from resource to resource here. Does anybody have any questions about Google Auto Drill? Um, by the way, before I even get to that, you can see I can change my paper size. So if I wanted to do it on that size piece of paper, I could. There, there was certainly the option to download this, to share this. Um, it, it, when it talks about artists, there are all kinds of tools in here about how about whose drawings these really are and how Google got it, got a hold of those. Um, but like I said, just kind of a fun little tool there with Google Auto Draw. So since it looks like there are not any questions about that, the next one I'm going to go to is Experiments with Google. And Experiments with Google is another really fun resource. Um, again, these are all free. These are constantly being updated here. But these are these. this is a place where you kind of want to just go and play. And a lot of these experiments, if you will, are things that are really cross-curricular. They're taking things like art and music, for instance, and looking at connections to science and math. So let's go into some of our art and culture experiments. Um, and you can start to see what some of these experiments are, you know, the dawn of art beyond scrolls and screens. So if we, let's just pick one of these and look at the overview. And truth be told, I have certainly not gone through every single one of these on my own. Um, there, there are so many of these, and this is kind of a big, you know, this would be a great resource for kids to say, hey, go play around with this and click on some things. Um, this is looking at Japanese scrolls, thank, looking at the detail in those Japanese scrolls, thanks to machine learning. So you're starting to really see some of these ancient scrolls, and as I'm reading through here, it's giving me, you know, really that intense detail. So if I click Launch Experiment, It takes me into this fantastic resource. I can skip the little introduction here. Um, it, it's letting me zoom in. It's letting me see detailed scenes from these specific Japanese scrolls. I can click here. I can see another tree. Look at these other things that we've uncovered here. So it's saying, okay, well, there's an animal. Well, show me the animal in here. And it's moving around. It's very interactive. And like I said, these experiments, these are not necessarily things where the students are having to type in answers, so to speak. There's no right or wrong path. It's all about exploring and finding something new and seeing how music and art can um, be engaged with in a slightly different way. Um, you can search these experiments. So if I come back over here and I want to search by music, for instance, there are a tremendous number of music experiments. This one is really cool, seeing music. And as music's being played, it gives visual responses to that music. Um, here, semiconductor, you can conduct an orchestra using your arms. Again, I have not tried every single one of these. So I'm going to have some fun with this. So make the orchestra faster. The faster you move your arms, move it up, move up and down to play louder and softer. It wants to use my camera, which this is already using. So it's going to make it hard for me because I'm not standing up right now. But you can see if I were fitting in that scene right there, I could move my arms up and down to conduct the orchestra. So I would need to back up a little bit, which for the sake of moving forward, I'm not going to do. Um, but you can see that there are a ton of these experiments through experiments with Google that you that are constantly changing. And I definitely encourage you to take a look at those. Um, another great resource also with a lot of connections to um, to our art world is the Google Arts and Culture website. Um, the Google Arts and Culture website has 
a tremendous repository of artwork from around the world, both contemporary and historical. You can explore various places. So we can go, for instance, to the Eiffel Tower in France. And now all of a sudden I'm on that observation deck because quite frankly, I'm getting tired of looking at the inside of my house this week. You know, So this is a great way to start to look. If I just go all the way around, I can look up. There's the Eiffel Tower. We can see where I am. Um, Google Arts and Culture has virtual tours of some of the most famous museums from around the world. If I click explore, we can explore videos. We can explore high definition artwork. We can tour famous sites and landmarks. I can look at art through different categories, through artists, through how did they do the art, through the specific art movement. I can look by color. So if I'm feeling in a red mood today, I can look at art that has red in it. Um, so again, Google Arts and Culture is a tremendous resource. This is something that can be used with students of all levels, um, whether it's taking a kindergartner on a virtual field trip or having your AP art history students at the high school start to look at some detailed artwork. As you can see, this, these art examples are from a wide variety of artistic eras, styles, and so forth and so on. Um, Again, if we click the menu over here, we can again see explore, we can look at collections, you can look at this through themes, you notice there is a link to the Google ex art experiments. Um, and you can search by any number of, of um, search functions. So if I want to look historical events, if I'm looking at this through the lens of a history teacher, and I want to look at um, World War One artwork, many of which will be, many pieces of which will be photographs, I can look at an historical event through the lens of art, whether that's propaganda, whether that's painting, whether that's photograph, depending upon the historical time. So again, a fantastic resource there with Google Arts and Culture. Any questions about either Google Arts and Culture or Google Experiments? So those first three were a lot of, you can kind of click around and play and there are a tremendous amount of resources on there that you can use for a wide variety of, of um, purposes. These last four ten are a little bit more interactive, starting with the Google Be Awesome, Google's Be Awesome Internet curriculum. This is something that's a little bit more geared to our younger learners, um, but this is a digital citizenship curriculum essentially that Google has created for free that is available for families and for educators um, on the internet. And you can see, let me pause this, it's all centered around these, these little characters, but there are games that the students can play in Interland, which as you can see, is an online gaming that teaches about dig digital citizenship and safety. Um, there are also resources for educators that are downloadable, again, all free from Google, to teach lessons about internet safety, about digital citizenship. There's a coloring book, there are printable activities. So I am not gonna click on every single one of these links for you. Um, there's even a Pear Deck interactive, ready to teach Google Slides. So if you are in this present situation, if you are looking for something to assign to your students and you're looking for something that is sort of already put together for you that you can just roll with, this would be a fantastic resource for you. Um, when you look at the slides presentations, there's a whole there, there was a whole menu item for the various slides presentations that you can roll right out with your students. You know, here's share with care, don't fall for fake, secure your secrets, it's cool to be kind, and when in doubt, talk it out. And as you can see, it is definitely geared towards our younger learners. I'm not so sure how our high school students would react to this, although certainly the lessons are so valuable and relevant for them, you may just need to do a little bit more tweaking to make that more age appropriate for our older learners. One of the, going, so any questions about the Google Be Awesome Internet Curriculum? Thanks, Andy. Um, 
So this next one is one that is definitely something that you can assign for students. It is something called Google Tour Builder. And it is, the students sign in using their Google account. Um, so if you are a G Suite school, this is COPA compliant, this is a Google product, it can be used K to 12. And it essentially uses features of Google Maps, which I'm going to be running a session tomorrow afternoon on Google Maps itself. But Google Tour Builder is a little bit of a sanitized version of Google Maps, if you will, that allows students to create tours. These tours can be of anything. They can be tours to track how a character in a work of fiction move. They can be tours of the battlefields of the Civil War. They can be tours of the natural national parks in the United States. So to access Google Tour Builder, they simply sign in with Google. Um, and they can do several things. First of all, they can view tours. So there are some canned tours on here that students can see. You know, it takes this one from service to scholarship, for instance. Um, but they can also make their own, which is really where this becomes interactive. Now, one forewarning I will give you having used this with students. You notice it says this is, this is in beta. This has been in beta for a number of years. There are sharing features with Google Tour Builder. It does not seem to work real nicely with kids collaborating in real time. Quite frankly, in this asynchronous learning environment, that's probably for the best anyway. Um, so what I've had to do when I use this in class is if I have students work in groups, the, the students just have to have one person who's responsible for really um, managing the, the tour itself, whereas the others can contribute by through ideas, by sharing Google Docs, et cetera. Um, You'll also notice up here, by the way, it also talks about how they can do a very similar project in Google Earth, which is a little bit more 3D. I'm gonna take you here though to create a tour. And it's gonna ask you to give your tour a name. Um, so, since I've been stuck in my house, um, let's talk about some vacation spots. And the author's name, you know, here we have Mrs. Swope. Obviously, it defaulted to that because I've done this with students. And I'm going to click Create. And this is where we get to the hub of what Google Tour Builder is all about. And you will very quickly start to see this is very user friendly. So it starts with an introduction. It asks me if I want to select an introduction picture. Sure. Let me search for vacation. Yep, that looks somewhere like I'd, where I'd like to be right now. Now, why is that? If I that one not. <laughs> For whatever reason, I did not like that particular image. So I'm going to trash it. We'll try a different one. Um, that's like, there we go. That one's better. It's going to ask me to tell a story. So I would rather be here than spend quarantined, right? Um, we can, you know, we can certainly have some fun with this. The type of story, do you want this 3D? Do you want this 2D? I guess that depends a little bit on how much drama mean you think you might need as you, as you go through this. What color do you want the path to take? All completely personal preference. Do you want to see borders? Do you want to see roads? If I click roads, you can see what's happening over here on my right side. Um, and this is just my introduction. So now I'm going to start to take you on a vacation, on a tour of places I'd like to go. And you'll see how this is super easy. I can add a location, one of two places. I can either just drop a pin. So, all right, maybe I want to go to Washington, D.C. I dropped a place mark there. So I'm going to click add to my tour. And I'm going to name this. And I'm going to say Washington. You see, I can add up to 25 pictures of places that I might want to go in Washington, D.C. So let's take a look. I can add YouTube videos. I can add my pictures. I'm going to just come over here and search for images. And let's say, uh, you know, let's just add Washington, D.C. And let's see, I'm going to hold down my shift key and I'm going to select a bunch of these. And I know I'm just randomly clicking right now. Um, but you notice it added a bunch of pictures. 
I can add start days and time. So I'm building a tour here. The kid, you know, I've done this with kids building historical tours to trace the route historical leaders have taken. I can add descriptions of this. So let's go to the Smithsonian and Capitol building, et cetera. Okay. I can change the icon. So, it, you know, if I don't want it to be a pin, maybe I want this to be an airplane for whatever reason. Again, I'm just spitballing here a little bit. And this is all adding itself over there. The other way I can add a location is I can actually type a location. Because let's face it, I would much rather be there than Washington, D.C. right now. So rather than dropping the pin, I just type the location. It can be a city. It can be a street address. You would be, I could add a building in there if I wanted to. And I'm going to click add to the tour. Again, you can kind of see, um, you know, the same basic features here. When I'm done, I can click done editing. And I can now, if I go back to my introduction, view my little tour. And I went a little too quickly. Sorry about that. So you'll notice that as I go back to Washington, D.C., it zooms in. I can actually control, by the way, how much that zooms in over here on this map. I did not show you that. Um, I could have done that back in um, Honolulu as well. And in fact, if I decide, you know what, I need to do that because I want my viewer to really see Washington. So I want my viewer to zoom in on, oh goodness, where did I land there? Um, I want my viewer to zoom in You know, let's go right here to the Washington Monument. And I'm going to put my guy, my little guy, tag man here. He's going to be right here at the base of the Washington Monument. And I want to, I want to lock this view. This is what, this is what I want my viewer to see. So now if I click done editing, you can see. If I go back to the if I go back to Washington D.C., I'm now right here at the base of the Washington Monument. Um, this can easily be shared. Again, you can add collaborators. It is a little clunky with that, but the easiest thing to do is for students to then click share, copy and paste this URL, which they could submit to you on Google Classroom as a link. So. Um, one of the, the one of the last things that is important about Google Tour Builder, if the students are turning this into you, you notice right here under the share button, it says who can access this and it says private. What I encourage the students to do is to click change and change that so anyone with the link can view. Because otherwise, if they do submit this to you on Google Classroom, it will say that you don't have editing access to that. Um, it's a very simple fix, and the kids just have to go in and click share and to ch and change that to anyone with a link can view. Um, but like I said, I've had a lot of success with students using this on Google Classroom. Any questions about Tour Builder? Looks like there's one coming in. Do we think that, yes, I absolutely think this would be a great use for third or fourth grade students um, doing a tour across the country in, in social studies. Um, I am a social studies teacher. I've, yeah, I, I definitely think they could do this. What I would probably advise doing if I were using this with students and you're teaching asynchronously, I would probably screencastify myself making one of these on my own. So log into Tour Builder by yourself. You don't have to do the entire tour, but show them how to use a couple of those features. And that way you can share the screencast with them and they can better see how to do this. But I 100% believe that third and fourth grade students could do this. I think maybe some of our primary students, um, you know, kindergarten, first grade would struggle a little bit with this. But 100%, I think a third and fourth grade, a third and fourth grade student can do this because I've seen my own kids um, work with things like this through elementary school. Um, the last two things I'm going to show you, and I know we're starting to run out of time, 
are great examples of kind of like canned lessons. They're also places where not only can I direct you here for student interests, but some of you may look at this and say, hey, well, I can learn something. Um, the Google Apply Digital Skills Program is a tremendous platform to teach students not just how to use digital skills, but how they can use these digital skills in real life. Um, so you'll see when you get here, there is a sign in, first of all. Um, again, it's all Google, you use your Google password. But before I even sign in, just to show you what some of the things are that are available, teachers can actually make classrooms here within the Google Applied Digital Skills Program. Um, as I start to scroll down to the different lessons, in fact, let me just go up to the top here. I'm gonna click lessons because I think this is one of the easiest places to see the resources. You can see the, num the filters here. Um, this is not something that would necessarily be appropriate for our youngest learners. Late elementary school, I think your third, fourth, fifth graders can, can handle this, definitely middle schoolers, high schoolers. And you notice there are adult learners here also. It also lets you sort by digital tool, which I find that that might be somewhat limiting. Although if you are trying to teach students how to use a specific tool, or if you want to learn how to use a specific tool, like calendar, for instance, you can check that off. Um, but you can also look by topic. So what am I trying to teach my, my students how to do? For instance, study skills and organization. These are pre-made lessons. You notice the time length. So given some of our parameters this week, you know, if you're a high school teacher, depending on what you're doing, this could be two days worth of your lessons. Um, how to evaluate the credibility of online sources, how to organize your time with the digital agenda, how to build healthy digital habits. Some of our study and organization classes at the high school have started to use these to really help build, uh, to really help build a skill set amongst the students. If I start to look at college and career readiness, um, let's create a resume. Let's um, learn how to organize college information, but we're going to do that with Google Sheets. Let's start to, um, you know, there's a whole lot about G Suite certification. Let's have learn. Let's learn how to get a new job. So we're talking like super practical uses. And, and super practical lessons that the students can use. Um, if I click on one of these, let's go to create a resume in Google Docs, it is self-directing. If I click start, it's gonna walk me through, and this lady is gonna start talking here in a minute here, it's gonna walk me through a prescribed lesson here for creating a resume in Google Docs. If you also notice over here the shared work, as I mentioned earlier, as a teacher, there you can actually create a, a hub on applied digital skills. Um, it is all COPA compliant for all grade levels because it's within G Suite and it works with Google Classroom. Um, and again, I know I'm starting to run short of time, so I don't want to get into too, too much of the weeds for this, but click around because it is a fantastic resource. This last one I want to show you is very similar to the Google Applied Digital Skills, but it's called Di Google Digital Garage. This is a little bit more for our older learners, but this has online certifications and courses about a number of really um, BCIT type topics, um, digital marketing, um, you know, some of these are obvious, can obviously be for adult learners, making sure your customers find you online. So any of you who also run some little side hustles, you may want to check this out for yourself. Um, but things like, you know, how to build confidence, how to understand the basics of code, how to um, increase digital well-being. These are lessons, these are free resources available from Google that can help with, you um, a wide variety of personal, professional, and educational needs. So I just wanted to point some of these out to you today. They, these are some of the hidden gems that Google offers that, again, they are all free. Um, I am more than happy if you have specific questions about any one of these, I'm more than happy to help you with any of those. But at this point, does anybody have any other any other questions about any of these tools and how you might use them and or where they may be appropriate for your students? Okay, 
If not, have a great afternoon. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about any of these, mswope at pensburysd.org. And I hope to see you at another session later in the day or tomorrow. Take care.